What the Tech, I'm Andrew Zarin. Of course, I'm joined by the king of bloggers and writers, oh, wow. Paul Thrott. How you doing, Paul? I accept your coronation. Do, do you call, consider yourself a blogger? <laughs> um, or do you have an issue with that term? You know, the truth is I don't. I, 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 I've, I've come to uh, terms with that, I guess. But um, no, I mean, I, I've been doing this for 20 years. I predate blogging. Um, I tend to write articles that are lengthy and have some form of analysis, whereas I think most blogs and most bloggers just regurgitate the same crap over and over again. So I don't mean to be negative about it, but I mean, look, sometimes I don't have anything to offer. I get it. And this a story happens and you have to write about it. But I would think if you would look at most of what I write, I it's not, it's provide not some value on top of it. And that's sure. not what bloggers do. Bloggers just regurgitate I mean, typically it's, it's almost like the whole thing like oh you do a podcast and like i don't i don't dislike yeah. the term podcast but i think it, it's ugh, you know i go eh, at the term i don't know why it makes me feel eh. yeah oh yeah i consider myself no, an I do too. Broadcaster. I, right so you know uh, you must have this problem you, you talk to people outside of the industry right which is everyone everyone <laughs> and um if you were to if someone said to you andrew what do you do for a living you know um, the phrase podcasting would not mean a lot to most people. And so I have dumbed it down. Eh, it's not the right term. I've simplified it or uh, just made it more general by saying, um, I, or in the in the case of podcast, to it's like an internet radio show. Yeah, that's all you got to tell and people. And then people say, oh, okay. You know, like that makes sense. I don't think podcasting is something that has slipped over to the mainstream for the most part. I've had a very difficult time explaining to people, like even even like family, like what I do for a living. And when you meet, like, you see someone that you haven't seen in a while and you kind of tell them what you do. Like, if you tell them a podcast, obviously, like you said, they're not going to know what it is. And I just, to make it as simple as possible, I go, oh, yeah, I, I do radio. Like, I'm on the radio or I do radio yeah. stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or even when you say, like, oh, I, I do internet radio, they always say, is that on satellite? <laughs> I just say yes now. Uh, my, I sh yeah, sure. I've been lying to people I'm for last sure year. Pretty sure satellites are involved somewhere. S yeah. Somewhere, yeah. There's there's some sort of relay happening. But I've been lying to people for the last year to make it simple for them and to make them like understand. They go, "Are you on satellite?" I'm like, "Yeah, I'm on Extreme Talk 152. I'm on XM. I don't nice. even know if that's the channel." And everybody goes, "Oh yeah, yeah, I know that station." <laughs> All these poor people are tuning in to some station that doesn't even exist. Um. <laughs> you know uh so paul i am i don't know what's going on i this is the first time i i just got back yesterday from my trip to california uh and it was a, it was the flight from hell i i should not be flying ever because i i have just awful experiences just flying around and i have not adjusted to east coast time i just woke yeah. up it was like 1104 i woke up oh you just woke up see i've been panic. up for I've been up for six and a half hours, Andrew. To which I say, "Screw you, buddy." Yeah, no, I just I had to get up really early. It was just an early flight. I uh, I but I didn't go to sleep yesterday. I had to take a red eye. I got into New York at like six in the morning. I got home at one because I had to fly to Newark because JFK grounded everything, and I didn't sleep at all. So maybe it was just that my you know I kind of needed to go to sleep. But yep. I'm running on West Coast time, and I'm like really off today. So I'm hoping. I'm able to gather my thoughts and kind of put together a decent show for you guys today. Just decent. You know what? I'm going to set my sights a little lower. Okay. And I'm going to say, no. <laughs> we'll see what happens. I'm so, sure it'll be fine. So you were in uh, D.C. Yes, I was. Uh, for the Partners Conference. Yep. And interesting news came out of there. A couple things. Yeah. Uh, um yeah, I guess the first one we could talk about really quickly is the layoffs. Eighteen thousand layoffs at <laughs> really Microsoft. Really quickly, really. <laughs> yeah, as as quickly as possible. Eighteen thousand people. Eighteen thousand people have been laid off. Majority of them are on the Nokia side, which was expected. A lot of the positions yeah, well, were redundant. Okay, by the way, so that's interesting you say that. Um, I am not a hundred percent sure. I would have expected that. Um, I think a lot of people did expect that. I mean, I, I um, 
you know, I had argued before this ever happened, Microsoft already had too many employees. They're taking on 25,000 additional Nokia employees. Um, you know, something has to give. And um, you're right that the majority of them are coming from Nokia. Um, and you're right that a lot of people thought that was going to happen. But my rationale for that not happening was you don't buy this giant manufacturing company. In other words, a lot of those employees are, are in factories building phones. You know, that was sure. one of Nokia's core strengths. And then get rid of all of that. Um, and I was wrong. Uh, so you do do that. And so um, that's 12,500 of the 18,000 are coming from Nokia and largely in those factory facilities. Okay. Um, and so they're what they're going to do is downsize or what Microsoft called right size um, its manufacturing capacity. Um, and they're going to close a couple of the factories and they're going to uh, focus on a couple of the other factories. They're not closing down all the factories. I mean, they're still going to make their own phones. Um, and so that was a big part of it. Yeah. What, what was it? Was it just uh, Nokia was a little too bloated in that sense? Or Yeah, I think that's the, okay. a good way to put it. Yeah. Or is Microsoft trying to you know, cut back on a lot of you know, what they've taken on? Yeah. Uh, by the way, so uh, a fellow a blogger, uh, not to <laughs> disparage her, uh, Mary Brasco, I'm a good friend, um, tweeted right before we started. She said, you know, uh, in response to someone else, I think Nokia might have been over capacity on manufacturing for the size of sales. For a while. Um, to, to which I replied, yeah. well, Microsoft certainly thinks so. You know, in other yeah. words, um, yes. And so a, a, it's funny, there's a lot of stuff around the layoffs, but when you bring in 25,000 people, that's one thing, right? So you over capacity just on, on employees. But there's also a different focus for that Nokia stuff inside of Microsoft because that Nokia stuff at Nokia was Nokia. Making phones was Nokia. That's what they did. At Microsoft, they are now like the smallest freaking part of a humongous and huge yeah. company, right? And making hardware devices, especially ones that account for you know, 4% of the entire market, uh, not necessarily core to what they're doing. So um, different focus, you know, um, on the Nokia stuff at Microsoft. So where are the layoffs going to be on the Microsoft side? Because obviously everywhere. Ev oh, wow. Everywhere. Everywhere. And I, I had, I got my, so I knew this was coming and, um, I got my first reports about, uh, layoffs yesterday. Um, and so they announced it today, but they, they, you know, on campus had already, you know, put aside rooms and people were being pulled in as early as last night. Was was this um, was this expected because of the you know a, a new CEO's coming in? He's trying to and he's made a know what? huge impact already on this yeah. company. Was it expected in that sense, or was this something that was going to happen regardless? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so um, I, this is something that should have happened earlier. Uh, this is something that should have been doing, you know, happening all along. I'm sorry, my Fitbit is refusing to attach to my wrist for some reason. Um, I've been calling on them to have this kind of layoff for a long, long time. I mean, even back in 2009, when they laid off, you know, 5,000 people at the height of the economic recession, you know, 5,000 people out of like 100 is uh, not great, yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, 18,000 is more like it. And and frankly, I, I think they could go even deeper. But Microsoft is a company that has multiple layers of hierarchy, uh, multiple layers of people between an idea and a decision being made, and hopefully a big part of this. Because we don't know the exact details. I've heard my own things. I'm sure Mary Jo has heard all kinds of stuff. She has a lot more contacts with this stuff, and I haven't talked to her yet today. But, you know, Sachin Nadella talked uh, earlier in the week in his memo about um, – shortening decision making times and part of the shortening occurs when you get rid of those layers sure you, because you it's a total bureaucracy decision. at this point i mean for, for them yeah. and, and for a lot of other companies uh yeah. you know apple is a is is a people think you know it's this open idea it is very structured and depending on what the vision you're in you have no contact with anybody else you're, you're sectioned off and you're put far far away from them well by the way the other thing that apple does is apple runs itself like a bunch of mini startups and so you know, the groups that make things like the iPhone and the iPad and whatever else are really small. Yeah. And they don't really interact a lot with the other parts of the company, although that, that could be changed. I mean, I way. could even tell you, um, like, within, like, let's say iTunes, for example, right? iTunes yeah. Music, iTunes Video, and iTunes Podcast are ran totally separate. And they don't yeah. have any contact with each other. I mean, it's it, and that that's from what I have heard firsthand from people that have worked for those divisions. So I don't know if it's still like this is a couple of years ago, but they they are, they do it also, right? Um, so I'm um, so anyway. I'm yeah. sorry, just to kind of complete the thought on that, I would just say that 
uh, regardless of who became CEO, this was coming. Regardless of who was going to be CEO, Microsoft had already decided to purchase Nokia. By the way, you know, Satya Nadella was against this. Um, now that he is CEO, he doesn't really have a choice and he's expressed his support for it. But the truth against is, the acquisition of, micro, of, yes, of Nokia. he would not have bought Nokia if it was up to him. Okay. Um, and I find that to be very interesting. Um, but, you know, you have these convergences, right? And so you've got this guy who's got a deep understanding of, you know, cloud first and, and how that works in the, the cloud world and um, how Microsoft can take traditional products and kind of migrate them over to new things in this new world. Um, but it doesn't really matter who he is. You know, they, they're buying Nokia. I mean, this is the time to do it. On, on this quarterly report, which is going to be the final quarter of their fiscal year that they'll announce on Tuesday, they're going to have to suck up $7.2 billion worth of Nokia, not to mention these severance packages. You might as well do this all at once. And if and I'm sure Microsoft, assuming it is legal to do so, will take the hit on the severances right now, right now to yeah. get this stuff all out of the way. And so people are astute enough to look at their financial yeah. results for the quarter and separate out the, that Nokia stuff and then kind of say, okay, well, here's how the business really did. And that's going to look awesome. But there's going to be this huge, you know, multiple billion dollars of hit that will occur. And that's going to look terrible, but it's a one-time deal. And that's what happens yeah. when you spend that much. And it's, be so. it's, be it's better for stock perception also, you know, for the yes. investors. Right. Uh, investors right. don't want to see a uh, one-time hit. You know, maybe, maybe, I know the stock went up yesterday because of this. But yeah, this, I, right. The stock market is totally unpredictable and, and you know, it, there's no rhyme or reason sometimes. But I think for something like this, rather than seeing this gigantic piece of the company, not gigantic, but a small piece of the company constantly hemorrhaging money, which would be the Nokia side because of all the, you know, things that they've taken on from there. I think, you know, it's not a bad decision company wise. I think it's awful for the 18,000 people that are getting laid off. But oh, of course, yeah. Uh, as far as what they were going to do, I think this was definitely expected. And this is what happens when you acquire a company. You no longer need those positions. The other thing, uh, just people may not understand this either. Um, and this happened back when they did the 5,000 layoffs, you know, three, whatever that was, five years ago. Simple math. Um, a lot of those people actually still work at Microsoft, right? So um, there are, Microsoft is still hiring. It's not like this is hiring freeze and Microsoft is, you know, uh, just shedding employees. Um, those, a lot of those people, some of those people at least can find jobs elsewhere in the company and will do so, you know. Um, not all of them, not most of them, but some of them. Certainly not a lot of the Nokia factory facility type guys. I mean, they, they, there's really no place at Microsoft for that kind of employee. But um, I would I would imagine a lot of the people in the Redmond area and elsewhere, you know, around the world uh, who do get laid off because of this. You know, some of them will be able to find positions at Microsoft and, and stay on. Yeah. Right. Because what, what they're getting rid of is not headcount specifically. Right. You're not looking for a number. In other words, the goal isn't to be 18,000 fewer employees, although it is to be some portion of that. The goal is to eliminate very specific jobs, right? Specific positions, because there's just too many of them. We, I mean, we saw the, them consolidating a lot of these positions and, and kind of working closer within divisions, which is something that they were not doing five years yeah. ago where everything was so separated. Um, do you do you see more of these layoffs happening? Um, the, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I guess the the thing I would say is uh, what I had heard previous to this would be that uh, this was going to be the most layoffs that Microsoft had ever done, you know, in his in its history. Um, the previous number was five thousand, and so I thought, you know, six thousand, eight thousand, something um, that would be the most, and that would be pretty impressive. Um, Eighteen thousand is much higher than I believe anyone thought was you know going to happen, and so honestly. It seems like he has taken a very decisive step today with the goal of not having to do this again. It doesn't mean it can't happen, right? It doesn't mean it won't happen. But my the way I look at this now, and it's still kind of early, but the way I perceive it is that the the point was to, to have to, you know big bang, shock and awe, get it over with, and move forward. And yeah. So we'll see. Um, also, I want to go now that we got that out of the way, Paul. <laughs> now that we got the biggest news story. Well, actually, so I, I don't know. I, I'm not sure what you want to talk about exactly, but there's a because you know you didn't. I didn't say. You know, you didn't do the minimum, man. I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm slacking. No, no, no. What are you? What are you I'm, I'm about? so it's sorry. Um, you loser. No. Um, I couldn't even. I couldn't even wake up to do my story. one hour job. 
Yeah. Um, there's a side story uh, to the layoffs that I think is the more important story, which is the devices business bit. And I'm not sure if you intended to talk about it. I did. But if not, so go, okay. go right into it. So Microsoft published two letters uh, that its executives have written to employees. The first, of course, was from the CEO, which talked about layoffs. But the second was from Stephen Elop. And Elop is the guy who was the former Nokia CEO and is now the executive vice president in charge of Microsoft's devices business. And so, obviously, a lot of the former Nokia is under him now. Actually, not as many as before. Not as many as before. Too, too soon, too soon. Anyway, but he also uh, runs the uh, Surface business, the Xbox business, uh, the PPI business, which is the perceptive pixel, the gigantic, you know, 82 inch screens and so forth. So any, anything devices related and, uh, his letter, at least to me personally, because this is the stuff I really care about windows phone in particular, um, was very, very interesting. And he talked about how, uh, windows phone was already sort of moving down the path to follow this new strategy uh, that Microsoft has, which is productivity focused. Um, when Windows Phone first launched, it's funny to me, uh, Windows Phone is only about four years old, but I think a lot of people actually forget the original point of the platform, the original strengths that the platform have, because things have really kind of changed over the years. We didn't have Nokia for the first couple of years that Windows Phone was out, the first year or so, whatever it was. Um, and when you, it's, it's interesting to go back and kind of look at it, because Windows Phone, as, pers- as uh, originally designed in t- 2010, was a consumer-focused phone, not an enterprise-focused phone. It was designed to go after that big chunk of the market that was buying up iPhones. Um, that obviously didn't go great. And so for the past couple of versions, they've been trying to fix that. And I, I'd say 8.1, uh, the version that's coming out right now, is uh, maybe the first one that is uh, truly enterprise ready in the sense that it has a bunch of the uh, support for those enterprise policies and the things that enterprises expect. It's not there actually 100%, but it's uh, much, much better than it was before. So Windows Phone has already been kind of making that move. Um, the other aspect of it is, is if you looked at how Windows Phone has been successful, because it has been successful in certain markets, um, it's the number two smartphone in uh, 14 markets. It's outselling iPhone. I think it was 24 markets. Uh, due due to their their entry level uh, emerging is the lowest. Yeah, the lowest. Yes. Like in, when I was in Mexico, I, and I was astonished by this. I want to say over half of the people walking around had a Windows Phone. Yeah. Which it, my it blew yeah. my mind. I, I mean, people, I didn't see yeah, any. People iPhones. in the United States uh, have a hard time believing stories like that. But uh, yeah, when you travel around, you can see, you know, in certain places, like these these phones are everywhere. And I I remember going to it might have been Madrid actually, but one of, either Madrid or Barcelona years ago, uh, back when uh, Nokia had just announced Windows phones, but wasn't quite making them yet. Um, there were Nokia ads all over that city uh, for you know previous phones for the whatever smartphones they had at the time. And it was really impressive because from the United States, Nokia is a not, is zero. It's nothing. And still, and sadly, kind of is. Um, but when you go to Europe, you know, when you go to uh, emerging markets as well, I mean, Nokia is, is everything. Nokia is like Kleenex. It's, that's what it means, phone, you know, to those people. So it's very interesting. So Windows Phone has had so, some success. We don't see a lot of it in the United States because it really hasn't had much success here at all. But in many markets around the world, South America, Latin America, um, parts of the Middle East, uh, parts of Europe, parts of Asia. It's done really, really well. And um, so they're, gonna, gonna, they're going to kind of double down on that, if you will. In other words, the primary focus of the Lumia lineup will be to focus on that low end of the market. They're not going to abandon the high end of the market, but they're going to focus on the volume part of the market, you know, where man, Windows Phone is free. You know, so they have a lot more partners uh, now than they used to. Um, up in, I don't remember when this, the Windows Phone bit of this was announced, but let's say April... You know, up until that announcement, we basically had four major makers of Windows phones, and two of them, HTC and Samsung, aren't exactly showing up uh, every year with new phones. Um, now we have like 12 or 15. I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, but there are uh, many, many companies making these things, and these things are all about to come out all over the world, including the United States, and so things could change. We'll see. But, but the thing that really got to me, the thing that I think is so great, is that Nokia, before it was purchased by Microsoft, and again, you got to remember when Nokia is Nokia, Nokia makes phones, Nokia is phones. Um, now Nokia is part of Microsoft. It's a little teeny part of Microsoft. Um, you know, they need to survive. They're not sure if the Microsoft thing is going to go through when they come out with this Nokia X lineup of Android-based phones. Uh, very controversial in the Microsoft world, you know. And a lot of people are um, excited for them. 
yeah, they're terrible phones and <laughs> pointless and whatever. And I've, I've read all the justifications for why these things are okay. I disagree with it completely. I've always said that on the exact same hardware, Windows Phone will do everything that an ASP phone will do. It already works. It's already compatible with all this Microsoft services you keep talking about. Oh, and by the way, Windows Phone runs more efficiently and better on that hardware. I've never, ever understood the justification for an Android-based phone from Nokia or Microsoft, ever. It has never made sense. It doesn't make sense. It will never make sense. Uh, they This stuff already exists and is better on the Windows Phone. So, I have no idea why they did this. So, well, I was going to say, if you were to take a wild guess on why they did this, or, or why, they, it, why they even because, released it. Why, why, you know, I know the project existed before the acquisition, but... Why yeah. they even released it? Well, um, I think part of it was, what if Microsoft didn't buy them? You know, what if a regulatory body in January or February of 2014 said, you know what? No, we're not going to allow this. You can't buy Nokia. Um, they needed a plan B. And again, you got you to put it in the perspective of Nokia. I mean, imagine, uh, first of all, aside from the impact on Windows Phone, right? But Imagine Microsoft announces, and I think it was in September last year, we're going to buy Nokia for some crazy amount of money, $7.2 billion. Uh, we're going to take everything that they have that's important except for the hair map stuff. And a couple of months go by and then they say, eh, you know what, we're not going to do that anymore. Yeah. Nokia would implode, right? Um, if they didn't have something else to do, th their business, which by the way has already been falling off a cliff anyway for many years, that would have, that would have been the end of it, right? So... In the same sense that them not buying Nokia probably would have been the death knell for Windows Phone, on the other side of the fence, the one we don't really think about as much, it would have been the death knell for Nokia as well. That would have been horrific. They never would have overcome that. And so I think this was just a hedge. Yeah. And uh, Microsoft uh, to date has been sort of polite about it. Uh, and they try to talk up, you know, they're making lemonade stuff. Well, you know, we can access Microsoft services and blah, blah, you know, who cares? Um, they're getting rid of it. So good. <laughs> And they're going to take the Nokia X phones they were going to make. They're going to call them Lumia phones, and they're going to put Windows Phone 8 on them or Windows Phone 8 1 or whatever. Perfect. And so they'll, you know, kind of continue selling and supporting the stuff they have apparently. But I think that's pretty much the end of that. And so in the sense of we've been looking for something decisive from Nadella, you know, he's talked in a lot of platitudes and kind of made vague pronouncements and we're this kind of company and we focus on this and blah, blah, blah. And it's, it's not very concrete. This I'm, is really concrete and it's really, really good news. So, I mean, it's amazing because the internet was buzzing two weeks ago about these phones. You know, every yeah. tech website was picking up the, the X line and the new phones that are coming out. And uh, I couldn't believe it. they announced a second. Do you, like for, I, do you think this was like the kin? Was this is was this like the the well, kin of twenty fourteen? Yeah, I mean that's a little tough, but yeah, sure. I mean, I'm sure you know, I'll try to find it. I mean, I wrote, I I have written nothing but scathing articles about this thing. I, there is, as I said, I mean, I, I don't, I'm not sure I could could or need to uh, <laughs> expand on it here, but um, there has never been any good reason for this to happen, other than you know, from Nokia's perspective as a plan B. No, Nokia, I have to say, you know, we've talked about this stuff. Um, there are only a couple of companies in the world who have the ability to create an app and media ecosystem for a, a mobile platform. And um, when you look at the Android part of it specifically, obviously Google has what they have. They make it. But beyond that, it's Amazon. They've done it. And by the way, nobody uses it. It's tiny. And uh, Nokia. No, Microsoft, Microsoft. I mean, not that Microsoft would ever do it, but now Microsoft. But Nokia, essentially, right? Uh, and I don't think Nokia could have done it without Microsoft, frankly, you know. And they did it, and it's weird, but now it's over, and I feel good about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you hated that whole thing. Um, hated it. Cheaper devices. Uh, that was another thing that was announced to kind of compete with Chromebooks. Yeah, so also. this is at the WPC, right? WPC. So it's it's interesting, you know, Microsoft, um, it's funny, they're moving quicker than they've ever moved, and there's no doubt about that, um, or more quickly, but it, it's interesting seeing things kind of come together. So again, I, I'm losing track of when this stuff happened, but earlier in the year, and, and I think this happened separately, they announced uh, lower cost licensing on Windows Phone, sort of vaguely, and a bunch of new OEMs came on board. 
And then we found out later that it was actually for free. They announced what they called royalty-free licensing for Windows devices, meaning uh, Windows 8.1 with Bing, probably, possibly other versions, but at least that version, and Windows Phone. So if you have a device that's nine inches or less with the screen, uh, Windows is free. And so if it's a phone, you get Windows Phone. If it's a mini tablet, you get Windows 8.1 with Bing. But there's also this class of devices that we used to call a netbook, right? Um, and today we don't call them netbooks because today those things often have really big screens. One of the weird things about the PC industry is, that, well, any electronics industry really is, uh, if you can make a big bulky device, it's cheaper, you know, than making a super thin little tiny device. And um, in the PC world, as we move to ultrabooks and all that kind of stuff, you can spend 2000 or more on an Absolutely. ultrabook if you want. Yeah. But you can get a big 15-inch hunking laptop for like three, 400 bucks. You know, it's kind of a strange deal. And for some people, honestly, especially if they're not traveling, uh, most people use laptops just around the house. You know, a 15-inch kind of heavy laptop isn't just cheaper. It's, it might be a better value. They can see it better. They're not, you know, it doesn't matter if the battery life is terrible. They're always next to an outlet. You know, who cares? Yeah. Um, but what this free and cheap licensing is going to do, and by cheap I mean if you have a device that has 9.1 inches or bigger screen, which would be a laptop or what we used to call a, a netbook, um, you get – Windows 8.1 with Bing inexpensively. We don't know what the price is. It's not free, but it's probably, you know, $1 or something. And now this new class of really cheap devices can appear. So on the tablet side, we're going to see Windows mini tablets that start at $99. And on the laptop side, we're going to see devices that start at $199. And what, that's, you know, that's Chromebook pricing. Is there a cutoff on the screen size? Like you said, 9.1 and above. Is is it from well, 9.1 to... If it's, if it's, yeah, so if it's 9 inches or less, Windows is free. Okay. Oh, okay. Free. If not, if it's if it's okay. if it's nine point one inches or bigger, you can choose to put Windows eight point one with Bing on it, and it's way cheaper than normal way Windows cheaper. licensing. Costs. Okay. Um. Here is my question. <laughs> <laughs> this seems right. like the netbook all over again. It is. It absolutely it is. is. And that that fell flat on its face when people realized well, what a hunk of piece of crap a lot of these netbooks were. Okay, but so you're, you're talking about it from the perspective of people who buy the devices. See, we don't care yeah. about those people. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I don't mean it like that. Um, uh, yes, I, what I would have said and, and what I did say, and because you know I bought netbooks and used netbooks and, and kind of offered my own take on netbooks and everything at the time, um, you got you know you get what you pay for, <laughs> yeah. right? But the the perspective here is more from Microsoft's perspective. So in the netbook era. Um, Linux was dead in the water, and then all of a sudden this netbook thing appeared. Small screens, really low resources, and running Linux because Linux was free, and it helped really keep the cost down on those machines. It was really bad timing for Microsoft. At the time, they were coming out with Vista, which was this gigantic, relatively bloated version of Windows yeah. that hadn't been fine-tuned and all that kind of stuff yet like they did later. And all of a sudden, netbooks happened. And so Microsoft's response to netbooks was to create something called Windows XP Starter Edition. And... Um, First, they sold them only in emerging markets. And Windows 7 finally came out, and they made a starter edition for that. They threw those on. They threw that on netbooks. You know, Vista never appeared on netbooks, right? It was just too big. So they had to make do with XP, even though they were selling Vista. I mean, and some Seven some came, did. So I, I have a netbook that came with Vista. Oh, did it really? That yeah. well? Okay, well, and yeah, not exactly <laughs> ideal. Yeah. Well, none of these are ideal, but you get the idea. <laughs> so, uh, by the way, so from Microsoft's perspective, it worked. They wiped Linux off the desktop. And so they they took what they would call now a hard decision to make a cheap version of Windows. They arbitrarily lopped off some features and they put out this piece of crap and people bought it and they didn't buy Linux. And that was the point. The problem is you flash forward now, it's um, you know six years later, seven years later, whatever. And uh, they're getting net netbooked again by Chromebook. But they're also getting netbooked again by Android tablets, especially mini tablets. So these are two different things, even, even though the strategy is kind of the same. So on the, on the Chromebook side, the strategy is simple. Low-cost laptops, Windows laptop, push the value of that. Some people will buy it. Some people won't, by the way. I mean, the one thing that Chromebook has over Windows is simplicity. If it does what yeah. you need, and again, I talked about these big laptops. It's good. If it's good enough. Life. Right. These same people can sit in their living room and use a Chromebook. They're going to have broadband internet. It doesn't matter. You know, the, the things that we complain about with Chromebooks may not matter, some of them. Um, so that strategy is fairly straightforward. Um, on the tablet side, it's a little more complex because Microsoft can offer OEMs uh, Windows for free on small devices. They can offer them Windows for cheap, you know, on bigger devices. But 
Android is not Chromebook. Android is dominant. Android yeah. has eighty percent of the market. You know, um, Android has sixty percent of the tablet market. Um, this is a different thing altogether. This is not Linux. This is not Chromebook. You know, this is uh, a dominant market for us, not a you know an up and comer you're worried about. It's a little late. And the other thing I'd point out, and I did point out, I wrote about this today actually, is that um, you know Windows doesn't match up to Android on a tablet at all. And, uh, and to be clear, I mean Windows, like the touch part of Windows. Um, you could make a nice comparison. I want to buy an iPad or whatever Android tablet. And you can have a good discussion around there. Um, you want to have a discussion around, you know, I'm gonna, I want to buy an iPad or an Android tablet or maybe a Windows tablet. I mean, you really got to <laughs> you really gotta sit, step back and be realistic here. I mean, there are obviously Windows people, right, who will, for whatever reason, you know, just lean toward that Windows thing, even though, I would argue that the Windows 8 tablet is, you know, almost not Windows, but whatever. Um, but the the real world, people are buying Android tablets and they're buying iPads. And you can show them a Windows tablet, but I don't quite get what the value prop is there. It's like if you want fewer apps and you want crappier digital media stores, um, hey, we, we have something too, you know. So they can compete on price, but they can't, they can't actually compete, you know, in any meaningful way. The, the 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 products themselves are okay, but it's the stuff you run on this. The have they have they set any guidelines as far as the hardware goes for the partners that are as far as you know you can't make this thing a total piece of crap. <laughs> so well, sort of actually because I mean, they one did of the that with eight point one. They did that with Windows eight, obviously. With you know they have to adhere to certain criteria no, no, well, for so the hardware. The problem is so. Uh, this was true with netbooks it, it's uh, as it is today y you've got this brand it's not a premium brand but it's a volume brand windows and there are pcs of all kinds and and, P and pcs go from some price to some price so like i said you could spend two thousand dollars on a really nice ultra book you could spend five hundred dollars on a actually a pretty okay laptop you know and then you have a kind of everything in between and some lower price things and some higher price things There's a lot of stuff in there um now netbook comes along, or Chromebook comes along, or these Android mini tablets come along, and they're selling for one hundred dollars, or two hundred dollars, two hundred fifty dollars. So you need to meet the price of that thing, but you also need to do it in a way that's not going to destroy the entire market for all of these other PCs. I, I've argued many times in the past because I have data from actually Microsoft and MPD that explains why this is actually a fact, but whatever that that Microsoft has effectively destroyed the PC market by going the volume low price route because once you offer something for next to nothing you can never step back from that yeah and it makes it hard for Lenovo to sell a two thousand dollar ultrabook when Lenovo also sells a three hundred dollar piece of junk laptop um, but you know that's the market so they're doing it again right and I think on the Chromebook side I think it's gonna be pretty successful I, I Chromebook has some advantages uh, Chromebook is also exactly one percent of the PC market so it's not like they're you know, for all of the success stories we hear, the truth is uh, Chromebooks really are not a huge deal. But the point well, is we want to keep it that way. Well, it's the it's the ecosystem. It's the simplicity of it. Uh, you know, I, w I went to California yeah. and I took hundreds of pictures. I edited all the photos within Google Plus. Really? Through their editor. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, you know, I added the filters. I cropped it. I, I, I you know, yeah, but I here's put the, the vibrance up. Like, like, I did it all on that. you had to be online to do that. You know, yeah, that's not did. offline. So, this relies on pervasive internet connectivity. I went to Quebec City a couple weekends ago. Couldn't get on the internet the entire time. I would not have been able to do that, and I would have been throwing that thing out a window. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not. Listen, I'm not actually just coming. I'm from the PC partisan side, and saying like Windows PCs are always better. I'm just saying. Obviously, Chromebooks have had some level of success. Some people really like them. I get it. I, I mean, I, I use one on and off. I keep track of what's going on with it. Um, it's improving big time. It's, it's absolutely meeting needs. Um, but it's not meeting all needs. And, you know, again, you're out there in the living room watching TV at night, Chromebook, you're online. It's great. Um, traveling, you know, it depends. You, you have to be in a place where you can, you know, be online and have a really consistent, good connection. That's not always the case. Um, on the flip side, Windows obviously works offline all the time, but Windows is also super complex in some ways and um, has to be updated manually sometimes, which is stupid and has all kinds of problems. It's big, you know. 
Um, and by the way, it has to be online sometimes to do the important stuff. Because if you wanted to do Google Plus photo editing on a PC, you'd have to be online as well. Yeah, and you know, I you, everybody knows how critical I've, I am of Android, but I had uh, you know even on my phone because it's it's the same editing software essentially in Google Plus and and on the phone through you know the photo app. Uh, everything you're doing actually is is the same, so you kind of know what to press, but. I was actually very impressed on how well they handle the editing and how easy it is. Uh, you know, a lot of people like to, like to add filters. A lot of people like to add, uh, you know, do HDR photos. The HDR on this thing post taking the photo yeah, in editing, yeah, yeah. it's unbelievable. So, by the way, uh, I don't know if this has happened to you yet. Um, from that same trip to Quebec... I, I one of the things I did in Quebec was I compared the cameras on the Lumia 1020 and the Samsung Galaxy S5. So on the on the Galaxy S5, it was backing up the photos both to OneDrive and to to Google Plus. So I got home and I was home for a couple of days and I got an email from Google that said, "Hey, your story is complete. You can check it out." And you go to the web and they've made like a little animated website movie thing that organizes your photos from that event and puts them all together, puts a map. So, you, can, you know, because of the geolocation in the photos and it's got this whole thing and it's done HDR in some photos. It's done like auto magic, what they call it. And they yeah. have um, if you take a, 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 um, a set of photos right on top of each other, it will turn it into sort of an animated GIF movie. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Um, and so it does all this stuff automatically. And I thought I'm looking at this thing and I'm like, it, on the one hand, it's kind of nice. And on the other hand, it's got that Google thing where it's like. Ugh, I wish they would just give it a rest sometimes, you know? Yeah, but like, um, it, it even, it even, I can like, see people liking it. Like, I took a bunch for Fourth of July. We, we stayed at a hotel that was overlooking the Brooklyn Bridge so we could see the fireworks. And I took a bunch of, you know, just photos of the skyline. It stitched yeah. the thing perfectly together. I didn't even try to do a panorama yeah, shot. Yeah, it just does it. It just yeah. does it. And I think for a lot of people, Th you this know. This is the kind of computer science that Microsoft used to get in trouble for, right? Yeah. This is auto suggestion, auto correction. Um, you know, like when I go in, on Windows Phone, when I when I <laughs> when I when I check in a beer, I'll often use the word hoppy, which Windows Phone will consistently replace with hippie. That's okay. I have never once meant hippie. I have never typed the word hippie on Windows Phone. It always does it, despite the fact that I often type hoppy. I always correct it when I see it, but I guarantee you, I have several check ins that just say hippie, and I, you know, I don't think anybody's ever said. I hate my ducking phone. <laughs> right. You know, like. Well, but you're gonna, yeah, sure, sure. I love that. I'm writing. I'm writing something, and I'm like, oh, this this ducking, you know, guy and whatever. You know, it automatically thinks it's ducking. I don't think anybody's ever done ducking. <laughs> uh, but but it was, you know, my trip was interesting because I used all my Google services essentially. That that's all I did, and you are right because it does it good enough. That's key for people. They just want to get by. They just want yeah. to be able to do it. Yeah. I know a and lot I, of people you know, made a big deal about Photoshop. You know, well, you can't do heavy Photoshop editing on, on a Chromebook. Right, book. and you, for a lot of people, it's like, right. Yeah, and <laughs> I'm like, you can't. Who, but, who uses Photoshop? I mean, I do, right? But but that's not normal. <laughs> you know, that's not a, a mainstream use. And that's I'm, the thing. I You know, people who listen to this podcast or people who read my website, are you know, they're technical uh, by and large. I mean... We're not necessarily the mainstream. I mean, you have to kind of put yourself out in that position. I mean, I, I, I you know, I, I work with what I have. So I have a family and they're whatever ages the kids are and you kind of see what they need for school and what they do and how they react to technology. I have a handful of friends. I'm not completely friendless. And I, and I look at, you know, how people consume technology and how they use it. It's, it's fascinating. I mean, some of my friends are some of the smartest people I've ever met and they're disasters when it comes to technology. Um, it would be entertaining if I wasn't, in fact, the person doing support and all that stuff. But um, yes, I, I and that was what I wrote in my Chromebook article, which was like, you know, you need to. It's important that you understand that not everyone needs this technical yeah. weird stuff that you're into, and and this thing does meet needs. And for a lot of people, it's just like I only sometimes need a keyboard. I'm going to write a paper for school. I'm going to make a flyer for some yard sale, whatever it is. Yeah. You know. I write every day. I need something that, you know, it's keyboard based, but th there are not hundreds of millions of people doing my job. So it's a little different. I, I do have to tell, I, I have not really played around with like the photo editing stuff on the Microsoft side. Yeah. Are, are you you're leaving? 
Okay. Jessica, Jessica Zarian is leaving. She just needed to tell me. Do you want? Can I tweet that? Or you could. You could tweet. Jessica <laughs> Zarian is leaving. Uh, um, I so on the iPhone side, I was actually really surprised on how I don't want to say crappy, but lacklustered the photo editing software on was on the phone. While on the Android side, it's it's comp it's not that it's complex, but it's far more intuitive and it's far more it just just they, they, you have far more options. I, I don't to really, tweak. I, mean, it's, I don't do a lot of on device editing. You know, I actually I have to say I think the Google approach where it it does that auto magic stuff as it's backed up to Google Plus is probably great for most people. Yeah. I, I do think that people should take the time to go look at it because it's not always going to be what you want. I mean, it, it, the, the thing that's a little scary. Kind of hyper expose it or whatever. Yeah. Uh, the uh, thing that's a little, you know, what's actually really funny. If I edit a, uh, a photo, if I edit a photo in Google Plus, like with their photos thing, and I download it and I try to send it to someone over iOS, like to an mm-hmm. iOS user, like via text, the yep. image does not display. That's interesting. Like the image is, it's a, it's a line. It's almost like it's been trunked to a line. I don't see it on my end, but they can if they click to open it. It's there's some weird, um, weird right. glitch with it. Uh, so wh- l- I want to take this moment. I want to talk about Patreon. We have a couple more minutes left. I want to talk about our Patreon campaign. A lot of funds coming in last week, guys. Um, I think we're at four hundred and thirty bucks uh, on Patreon. I, I think we set a goal at five hundred by the end of the month. If you are a fan of the show, if you enjoy the show, if you are a first-time listener of the show and you want to get more Paul and Andrew, we do a bonus show called What the Talk. <laughs> it uh, sounds so impossible. To think I know. That could be the case, it's, it's impossible for people to like us. Uh, we do a show called What the Talk where we talk about essentially anything, you know, whatever whatever comes to mind. It's, it's a post-show wrap-up. And the reason why we started doing that is because we would always have these conversations off the air and people would constantly say, why don't you put that as a podcast? You know, you should re- be recording this or... I, actually, one time we by mistake left it on, and that's how Christ. I got the idea. We didn't edit it out. We just left it on because right. I didn't take the pause for the editor to see where we pause. And they go, that, that conversation at the end of the show was great. <laughs> that podcast stunk, but that stuff you were talking about yeah. afterwards was great. Yeah, like I think you guys messed up and you left, let it running, but it, it was great. Why don't you put that as a podcast? So we don't offer it as an RSS. We offer it as an exclusive to anybody that's funding Patreon. We have a dollar. You could fund it for a dollar. You could fund it for five dollars. Uh, we in September, I'm hoping, uh, and that's the goal. We will be doing a lot of bonus stuff for the Patreon campaign. Right now, it, it's more of a test. We're trying to see what we can do with it. We are offering you the extra show. We're going to be doing the phone call show for sure in a couple of weeks. Uh, but we want to do more like giveaways for Patreon uh, you know, patrons, I guess I should call them, for people mm-hmm. funding us. Uh, we, we want to give away products. We want to give away. Uh, I'm working with a couple of companies to do that exclusively for Patreon people. But if you want to watch the the after show, what to talk, you go to patreon.com slash what to talk. You can fund us. We, we suggest a dollar. You could do a quarter. You can do whatever you want to do. Whatever, whatever you feel we are worth. You go ahead and you do that penny. Maybe maybe I'm worth a penny. Uh, but it, it's been a big help, and we want to cut back on ads. That's the purpose of this. We don't want to sit here and stop the show every 15 minutes and do an ad. So we're testing this over the summer to see if it's possible for us to fund the show, make it worth for us to cut back on the ads. And, uh, you know, Paul needs to buy sneakers, guys. Actually, I do need to buy a new pair of shoes. Uh, new Balance? My I see shoes yourself were as an- destroyed in, in a flash flood in D.C. Was it really? I should have a Patreon campaign for that. Yeah, you know what, guys? Fun, fun, fun Paul shoes. Look, my feet don't, you know, protect themselves. That's all I'm <laughs> yeah. saying. Uh, let's see. What are we at right now? This is actually really cool to to take a look and see where we are. Uh, someone in the chat. Uh, let me see. Oh, Suncast put a link. Uh, let's take a look. We have 297 people funding it, and we're at 438 bucks. That's actually awesome. Uh, so. Uh, patreon.com slash what the tech if you want to fund it i know last week we got a ton of people just flooding it uh which is greatly appreciated uh, and of course uh you know thank you so i um the last couple minutes why don't we talk about my trip to twit i went to twit paul okay i took a trip 
I, yeah, I saw, uh, I saw. Le, Leo and I, I was uh, on Facebook marveling at this. Leo and I tussled on the ground for you. We fought over you. We had a steel cage match. <laughs> nice. Yeah. You both won. Yeah. In the wrestling business, it went to a uh, 60 minute Broadway. That's what they would call a draw. I think we agreed okay. that uh, we could share your love, oh, which, uh, nice. which is nice. Uh, I went over there. Um, I, I, I do want to tell you something, though. It is amazing to see the facility that they have. I mean, it, that that's mind blowing, and it, it just it just unbelievable yeah. to go there. I had lunch with Alex. Uh, what a good guy! He's a Windows yeah, Alex Phone is user. The best. Yep, he yep. loves Windows Phone. Uh, we had lunch yep. with Alex. We spoke about you. Okay, uh, we, well, that's disconcerting. Yeah, we had a whole conversation <laughs> about you. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was just it was a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun going there. Going to just just traveling from San Francisco to Northern California, when you talk about technology uh, and our reliance on it, like I forgot how to drive without a map. Like I I don't know how to do this anymore, and it's not always the technology. These softwares that we use don't always work too well because they're relying on you know hardware and space to kind of tell us where we are. The entire time it was off by like a half like five hundred feet. So we would tell us to make a turn, and this is through like the Waze app. And I, we tried it on the iPhone, and we tried it on my Android uh, device, and it, they both had that problem where it was like 500 feet off on everything. Huh. And I found that I found that shocking that I, I don't hear about that too often. And I and I asked one of my friends that that uses Waze all the time, and he travels a lot. He's like, yeah, you know, at times like we rely so much on this hardware to work, and it sometimes doesn't. And when it doesn't, we don't know how to act. You know, like we kind of panic yeah, 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 yeah. when it's I was like, what do I go? What do I do? It's they tell me to go around in a circle. So it, it's I think it's just going to get worse. I, I just think that we're going to we're just relying on these things so much where we've kind of dumbed it down, where it kind of tells us to do everything. And when it fails, we'd like, OK, what do we what, what happens now? I don't know if that's happened to you, like especially when you're traveling because you don't have all your stuff with you. Oh yeah, yeah. In fact, I based on my recent couple of trips, I'm going to do another. You know what I? In what fact, maybe use? this could be the topic for afterwards. You know, like what? You know, like vital. You know, technology or not technology that like just makes traveling better. You know, I. It's hard. You know, when you used yeah. to when you have this kind of consistent set of stuff when you're home and you kind of rely on it. it you know, going away. Um, you know, it could be difficult. No, it, it definitely can. And and I would like to know what you're actually taking because I took my laptop, obviously, and I took my phone. That was it. I didn't take the iPad. I didn't take any of the other stuff. Uh, but I still felt like I, I was missing something because I rely on so many different devices for everything. Yeah. Like, it's not that... And this, this is the problem that I think Microsoft faced with Windows 8 where they tried to make this one device where it is your iPad, it is your your laptop it is you know it's just one right. ecosystem and right. it, in concept I, I think on paper that's phenomenal but there are things that you do on your phone that you will never do on your laptop <laughs> it's like saying you know there are things in vegas that you do that you would never do in your hometown like i i have a difficult time doing certain things like even even like the photo editing for example i could do it far quicker on this than i can on my on my laptop Via the same service with, right. you know, Google Plus. It no, just doesn't it, feel I, comfortable. Um, one of the hardest things, I, this is just dumb maybe, but I have a very specific workflow, you know. Um, and it, at home I have this 1920 by 1080 screen, which is not particularly high resolution really anymore, right? Uh, 27 inches. But to me, like, uh, Windows scale, it's just normal, 100% scaling. There's no weirdness. Everything looks exactly right. It's great. And when I do things like edit photos and Photoshop for my website, it's I know the exact resolutions of things, and it works great, and I love it. And coming back from a trip where I've been using the Surface Pro 3, which is actually a great device to travel with, but smallest screen, super high resolution, got to do weird scaling in every app, everything's a little bit off. Coming back to this screen, it was like, oh, nice. Like, it was just, it's, it's like when you've been in a hotel for a week and the shower is terrible. And then you get home and you get under your own shower and you're like, thank you. <laughs> you yeah. know, it's just so wonderful. It, it's just like that. And um, that's, I don't know, it's, it, I hate, it's, yeah, it sounds like a first world problem. It, it is, it, and it is. But 
this is also like my career, <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm not going to travel with a big screen and a real keyboard and all that kind of stuff. I'm not, I'm not an idiot, but, um, it makes working remotely less enjoyable and less, defi- less efficient, you know? But is it also the fact that you're just not used to it? No, no, no. It's, it's literally that it doesn't work as well for me. Um, you know, for example, on my, uh, now two year old ultra book, 15 inch screen, 1600 by 900 resolution. Anyone today would hear that and say, Oh my God, that's so old fashioned. You know, you know what? hundred percent scaling everything. It's just like this big screen. It's smaller, you know, but everything is exactly right. I love it. Um, surface pro three, again, awesome companion on the road. And for many people would not have the issues I'm about, you know, that I've been describing, but you know, uh, Chrome scaling a little off, a little different. IE scaling off, a little different. Photoshop, I have the Elements version, so I don't even have the ability to scale. It's ridiculous. It's like little tiny one point fonts on everything. I, have, you know, when I do like um, an imagery size, I have to hit, use very specific sizes, and I'm squinting to see the screen because like the little numbers are so tiny. Um, it, it's not because I'm not used to it. It's because it's not right. Yeah. And you know, Windows just doesn't work well on these super high resolution screens. It, you know, and for certain things and certain things that I do, um, you know, Word, PowerPoint, uh, OneNote, those things work great on regardless of screen size. You know, they've, they've been written correctly. Uh, I think Word, Word on the iPad is actually really good. Word on yeah. the iPad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, was, I had to use it for the first time. Last time we traveled, my wife was using it to, you know, do some something for work. And I, and I was like, I don't know how you could do that. Like, I don't know how you could just type on the glass like that. Um, but it, it's right. word, it's full word. I had to use it coming back. I had to write up a contract and it, it was great. I was actually really surprised on how efficient it was on an iPad, on a tablet. Right. Uh, you know, one thing that I was baffled by is the fact that I went through so much data. So, I was gone for way, a week. I went through yeah, everything. I, so I had this exact problem in Quebec and, and I, you know, um, in fact, <laughs> This is the type of thing I could do online. It's the type of thing I could do on the phone. But sometime in the next seven days, I'm going to take get my car and I'm going to go to the AT&T store and have a little conversation with these people. Because I'm about to go to Europe for three weeks. Maybe this is something we should talk about in the after in show. In the post show. Oh, yeah. Sure. yeah. Uh, let's, let's talk about that later. It, okay. It's This is a problem. You know, um, you know, you went to California. At least you can get there and your phone works. and It does. You know, whatever. But I, for, I forgot on the fact that, you know, every photo that you're taking is... Two gig, two megs, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Two to three megs. Well, I mean, I don't know what you're using exactly, but if you're, you know, a Windows phone at least, um, uh, the highest quality photos, the ones you want to back up, only back up on Wi-Fi, so it doesn't have to. So I was not doing like, that. Yeah. I, you know what? I was connected. No, but you know what? It's still a lot of time. stuff to manage. That's the it problem. Is. Isn't like, it is. Like I have video. So in other words, I have video. You, if, that whatever you're that. using, you have an Android phone or whatever. Yeah. There's probably a setting in there. No, only there back is. Up on Wi-Fi. Yeah, sure, but. No, but but this is again. People are, are probably hearing this and thinking like first world problem. But the the sheer number of stuff that you need to think about on a trip like this, and then you can exponate it out, you know, for which is probably not a word for uh, international travel is I th- really think too much for most people. I, I just think people don't do it. It's the reason why when the iPhone first came out, people came back from Europe with five thousand dollar bills and a stack of paper in the mail from AT and T, like. I, it, it's it's not right to to force people to to do the heavy work on this stuff. Yeah. You know, it's too bad. All right, Paul, let's wrap it up. It's uh, one oh four in the studio. It's getting hot again, and I will melt. Uh, go to our website gfqnetwork.com. This was our first show back from vacation. We took a week off last week, and we did this show on Thursday instead of Tuesday. But I think we're back to normal. This is it, right, Paul? We're we back to normal. Well, yeah, except that then, <laughs> that I'm going to Europe in two weeks. But except yeah, for the fact yes. that Paul's going to Europe in two weeks. No, but I mean, I, I conceivably, we should be able to do it at the normal time. Yeah. Assuming I have something better than a DSL connection where I'm going. Where are you going this time? Barcelona. Oh, okay. Okay, very cool. Uh, Windsuperside.com, all things Paul Therott. Uh Paul also does a phenomenal show called Windows Weekly every Wednesday. Every Wednesday at 2 p.m. East on the Twit Network with Mary Jo Foley and, of course, Leah Laporte. Uh, we record live every Tuesday, 99, 90% of the time. You know what, guys? It's been a crazy, crazy couple of weeks. Paul's been traveling. I never travel this much. Where I'm, I'm doing everything that I can to kind of keep the show 
at the normal time. But it's the summer. People are on vacation. But all alas. I know. Not. I know. Uh, I know. I know it's, it gets a little annoying for people, but I'm hoping everything's back to normal. Uh, we record live every Tuesday at 3 p.m. East here on GFKNetwork.com. Subscribe to us. We're everywhere podcasts are available. Uh, you could you could download us on uh, Windows Phone, on iPhones, and every everywhere you could imagine. We also have an SD version for the video. A lot of you have been asking for a mobile friendly version for the video because it gets up, you know, it's almost like a gig. So we have offered that. So subscribe to that too if you're uh, you're listening. Also, I want to thank the people that fund our Patreon campaign. I want to thank the people who watch the show, and uh, we'll see you all next week, guys. Good night.